Great. Uh, good, to, good to see everybody. Thank you uh, for being here in person. Uh, thanks for those that are online tuning in. Uh, so my name's Kyle Solomon. That does not look like me. I am not Adriana Salazar, although sometimes I would like to be. Um, so Adriana was supposed to be here today. Uh, unfortunately, I had to stay in New York, so I'm pinch hitting. Um, I have been at, uh, so I'm a, a managing director. Uh, I'm what they call uh, a relationship investment banker. I've been at Cowan for 11 years. I recently uh, switched my focus to, uh, to be in Pittsburgh a lot more. So we have a, a thesis at Cowan uh, that believes that there's a lot of capital that sits on the coasts that a lot of the time stays on the coast, but there's plenty of good opportunity that sits with inside the coast. Pittsburgh being a, a great example of that. So I am a Pittsburgher, even though I've been living in New York for 26 years. I like to say that my mind and body are here. I just happen to live elsewhere. Uh, so it's been really nice for me to come back and, uh, and kind of lean on some relationships that I've built over the years here, uh, both on Wall Street and in Pittsburgh. Uh, Dave Winnie has been uh, an amazing partner of ours, uh, hence us being here. So uh, look forward to uh, chatting with you and kind of going through the presentation, and I'll kick it over to Peter. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us. I'm Peter Finn. I'm a managing director within Cowan's Industrials Group, worked for Cowan for three years. Um, within Industrials, I lead our coverage of industrial technology, which includes primary focus on themes that tend to be higher growth in nature within the industrial landscape. So robotics and automation, IOT, advanced materials, uh, a lot of the enabling technologies is where I spend my time. And so very happy to be here today. I know that probably resonates with a lot of the businesses that are growing within the Pittsburgh region and within kind of the CMU ecosystem as well. So I'd say that, that we started uh, our effort uh, in earnest probably about a year and a half ago. Um, so, uh, our CEO, Jeff Solomon, there is a relationship between me and Jeff, just so you know, uh, he is also a Pittsburgher, uh, Jeff and Adriana, uh, were the first to kind of view Pittsburgh, uh, internally as a spot that we wanted to spend more time. So we spent about a year and a half, uh, prior to me actually joining and now leading the effort. Uh, but we figured we'd take a little bit of time before Peter gets into the, the meat and potatoes of why you're here. And kind of just take a look at, uh, for those of you that don't know who Cowan is, uh, we're a publicly traded company. Uh, we were uh, announced about a month ago, we are being acquired by TD, Toronto Dominion Bank. So double A rated Canadian bank. Uh, that, that merger should be completed hopefully within six to seven months, uh, which helps us tremendously from a balance sheet standpoint uh, and very complimentary. So both from a capability standpoint, we provide a lot of US services that they don't provide on the investment banking side, uh, on the market side, on the research side, and vice versa for us. So super complimentary. We are publicly traded, as I mentioned. Uh, you can see that just from a, a scope perspective, uh, we did close to $2 billion in revenue last year. I joined 11 years ago. And when I started, uh, we were close to uh, $200 million business on both sides. So we've had some decent sized growth. We have 250 investment bankers uh, that that um, that bank across all sectors. Uh, we have 800 securities that we cover from a public standpoint, uh, and we have a total of 1,400 employees globally. I think that what what we'd like to point to, and again, you see from 2013 to 2021 what the growth looked like. Uh, we accomplished that. Uh, not only organically, but also uh, through our platform uh, expanding acquisition strategy. So if you take a look at here, these are some of the transformative uh, acquisitions that we've had over the past 10 years. Uh, but I think from, from this point, which probably is, is most important is towards the tail end here, where in 2018, we acquired a small investment bank, Corton. Uh, that opened our investment banking strategies and, and gave us some additional M&A advisory capabilities based out of Detroit and also gave us an a, a further international exposure. Uh, we acquired MHT in 2020, uh, which is an investment bank that was based out of Dallas uh, that also um, had M&A advisory capability. 
Uh, and, and additionally, in 2021, we acquired a, um, a bank uh, called Portico based out of San Francisco. Uh, and you can see there that, again, not only m and advisory, but also software data and analytics. So just helping to broaden our scope overall um, as, we, as we grew and wanted to become a better partner. We'll hit this part relatively quickly. Um, wouldn't be investment bankers if we didn't give you a commercial in advance, but this actually is relevant in the context of discussion today, which is really centered on how investment bankers can be useful and relevant to you from an early stage in your life cycle, kind of throughout the trajectory of your business. So early on, it could be informal, uh, it could be um, you know, on a non-engaged basis, it could be relationship building, it could be market related, could be helping you identify customers or opportunities or investors along the way. Those are all things that we do from an early stage. And you can see in terms of the scope of transactions that we advise on, it's anything from raising capital privately for uh, growthier companies. Uh, you get to the point where you're considering acquisitions. We can either be buy or sell side advisors unless you're thinking about you know, potential public market exits, um, either through traditional IPOs or SPACs or follow on offerings. Those are areas that we're all active. And so I think you know, part of the message I want to take away from today is um, you know, investment bankers can be partners to you along the journey. Um, some of that will be on an engaged basis at certain times, but there's also relationship building that I think can be mutually beneficial at different points in time. And that's where you should start thinking about that early, understanding how to nurture and develop those relationships so that at points in times when you need formal advisory help, um, you know, we can be a partner to that or other banks for that matter. And I think Kyle made this point on the last page, um, you know, we've done a lot of M&A on our own. In those cases, we're bringing in advisors as well. That's, you know, investment bankers need investment bankers at points in time as well. We'll, uh, we'll spend a few minutes kind of just around our award-winning research coverage. Um, so I think one of the things that makes Cowan a little bit different is, is that we are a full service investment bank. So it's investment banking, it's markets or trading, it's research, which is, which is highlighted um, on this slide. So you can see that it's a, it's a collaborative approach. We have 50 publishing equity analysts that produce research. Um, we cover just under a thousand publicly traded names. Um, so we do a lot of work on the back end once companies go public. Uh, we have seven senior Washington policy analysts. That was another acquisition uh, that we made along the way, the Washington Research Group. Um, and I think we were... And again, this kind of points to how we like to differentiate ourselves. We were one of the first brokers on the street that actually had a proprietary ESG scoring methodology around our research. So what we like to do is listen to our customers along the way. They needed a solution. We felt that it was very important for us to overlay that after listening to them on our research product. And we've gotten a tremendous amount of uh, positive feedback on that. So not only is it buy, sell, hold, but there's a score from one to a hundred that designates how ESG friendly uh, a company would be. Um, and then you could just see some of the, uh, the numbers down at the bottom. Um, it's, uh, it's, been a, uh, it's been a business that we've invested in. Uh, it's been a business that we have great penetration in. And it's a business that we use not only on the market side, but on the investment banking side, as we plug in uh, potential companies and customers into that vast research base. Great. So with the benefit of that background, I want to get into a little bit more of you know, what it is exactly investment banks do and how they can be a resource to you as you grow your business from an early stage. I think the, the key takeaway uh, that I want to make sure that you understand is uh, while investment banks, by their very nature, stay in business by generating fees from clients, a good investment banker and by definition, a good investment bank, which is comprised of bankers, uh, is successful because they don't view relationships purely through a transactional sense. So, you know, the point Kyle just made about research, we want to find ways to be relevant to your business at a very early stage. That may be, you know, as you're putting together a, a deck on your business and you're looking for uh, market data, some of our research may be helpful to you in that regard. And so putting resources across our platform in areas where we have differentiated expertise uh, to use for your benefit. Again, that's not on a fee paying basis, but 
for us uh, and for investment bankers who are investing in relationships with growth oriented companies, you know, it's getting to understand the company's uh, differentiation, the competitive landscape in which you operate, the strategy, your kind of your long term objectives. And by nature of that, that allows the, the banker that can be a extension of your organization. You know, when you're a young company, you may be kind of limited in resources. And so having eyes and ears uh, thinking about your business externally can be a value added resource. You may identify opportunities or customers or acquisitions or technologies for you to partner with at an early stage that maybe weren't on your radar. And so part of that means they need to kind of understand your story. And so looking to engage and understand early in that first point is important. And that's the way they could be a source of ideas for you. Over time, as your company matures, as you hit various milestones, as you achieve greater scale and the diversity of services that you may require expands, the role of the banker is to then bring in additional resources across the firm. That may be product partners in you know, raising private capital, uh, M&A partners, um, raising public equity, uh, and bringing those to bear on your behalf. I think that's an important element of as the relationship matures, bringing the full resources of the firm to your benefit is important. And I think as part of understanding those relationships, what's also going to be important from your perspective is, you know, building multiple relationships and then understanding as you hit different points in time and your trajectory as a growing company, you know, how can a particular firm be value added for you? So certain firms are better at certain products or in certain areas. And so as you think about at a point in time and your company's growth and trajectory, you know, which bank can be the best partner to you? We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but want to make sure kind of that's understood up front. So in terms of, you know, benefits to hiring a, a financial advisor, I'd say go through this relatively quickly, but a few points I think that are worth making. So when you engage uh, formally with an investment banker, and I think we talked about previously, you know, there's plenty of ways to engage in an informal basis where bankers can be helpful. We'll talk about those a little bit more. But when you do hire an investment bank, there's a signal that it makes to the market. It means you've got the board support, you've got management committed to it, you've got alignment with a partner in achieving a particular objective. That's important because there's also a signal that, um, you know, you may not want to send. So, you know, at an early stage, if you're raising you know, a seed round or a series A round, or maybe even a series B round, it may not be the best interest of, uh, for you to formally hire an, an advisor. And that may be because uh, investors at that point in time want to interact and, and hear directly from the founder without the benefit of kind of an intermediary running a process. So there's definitely signaling mechanisms that um, come from hiring an investment banker, both positive and negative. And so, you know, being mindful of that, I think is, is something that's important. But when you do hire an advisor, um, what you're getting is the benefit of somebody that's got, you know, a ton of experience in the space and delivering the products that you're looking for. And so, you know, what that means is you may be, you know, a, a, you know multiple uh, times founder, you may have had successful exits, you, you may probably have a you know, good understanding of M&A, raising capital, um, but markets change. I mean, look where we are today. Um, you know, the market is quite fluid. The private capital raising environment has gotten a little trickier. Terms are evolving. Um, valuations that were available, you know, six months ago are not, you know, the, the valuations that are available. So having somebody that's experienced in the market on a daily basis, uh, understanding how the market's evolving can accrue to your benefit. And then the other important part is that, you know, anyone who's spent time, you know, raising capital or selling a business understands that, in addition to running the day-to-day -day business, that's an entirely separate job all of its own, which requires a lot of time and attention. And so part of the role of an investment banker is also to take as much of that responsibility in running and structuring a process off your plate so that you can continue to run the business. The last thing you want while you're raising capital or trying to sell your business, for example, is to have a stumble on the operation side. And so allowing you to continue to focus on you know, maximizing the, the upward trajectory of your business and then finally, there's negotiating benefits. There's roles that bankers play when you're uh, negotiating with counterparties. You know, we can play the bad guy role, but you know, we can also help you position the business in a way that we think will resonate having ongoing conversations with buyers and investors in the space, knowing what they're focused on, and making sure to position the business to maximize it. Just talk a little bit about, you know, just thinking about a financial advisor. I, I go to the peril of a personal financial advisor who's a fiduciary for, for their clients. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, when you're looking at a startup, the board and, and chairman of the board is 
fiduciary responsible for, for the financial uh, propriety of the of the business. How does a bank play into that? Are they also fiduciaries or do they help to, to kind of support the company as they uh, look after their best interests? Yeah, I'd say the, the key dynamic there is um, alignment of interests. And so um, don't have a detailed slide on this, but if you think about you know, how you formalize an engagement with a financial advisor, it's to ensure alignment of interest in terms of achieving a successful outcome. So you want to decide, you know, what is it that your objective is and then aligning um, kind of financial uh, arrangements to be you know, reflective of that. So if you're looking to raise, you know, an amount of capital, it's, you know, uh, based on the amount of capital you're seeking to raise. If you're, you know, looking to sell your business, it's, you know, percentage of the, the amount that you're, um, you know, hoping to achieve in that sale. And, you know, you may set thresholds that align with achieving a superior outcome. If you think the business should be worth a hundred million and, you know, the, it might be a percentage of that. And if the business sells for 150 million, then there's a higher percentage on that basis. So the, the general idea should be um, as long as there's delivery of an outcome that's in line or exceeding expectations, then the compensation arrangements are a reflection of that. So um, in terms of, you know, how bankers do get engaged, I'd say there's a number of different ways. Um, so, you know, a lot of it is uh, developing relationships early. And again, this is through, you know, we, we as a firm do this a lot through, you know, organizations uh, like, you know, Mass Robotics in Boston and Pittsburgh Robotics Network here or in the CMU ecosystem. It's getting to know companies early, uh, finding ways where we can be, uh, you know, a partner and in, in understanding businesses early. You know, that's to our benefit too, as somebody who spends all their time around robotics and automation businesses, I want to understand like what are the new and interesting companies and technologies that are you know coming down the pipeline that are disrupting the innovative companies that are already in the market. So it's definitely a mutually beneficial dynamic there. But you know that's the way by understanding your business and your strategy that we could be an interesting source of ideas. So that again, at a point in time in which you say, hey, you know what, um, you know somebody's approached me with the acquisition proposal. Um, I'd like your help in thinking through that. I already understand your business. I can be, uh, I'm not starting from scratch. I can be more helpful in terms of thinking through those dynamics. And by the way, there's other ways as well. So, um, you know, we spend time with investors. Many of them could be your existing investors. They may have had a good experience and understand, you know, there are banks that are particularly good within a certain sector or subsector. And so, you know, you build relationships with the investors, with companies, um, and then also with, you know, some of the potential, you know, acquires in the space so some of the more mature companies as well, understanding how that ecosystem is evolving from different perspectives, I think accrues to your benefit too. Um, and then the last thing is just, you know, referrals, you know, certainly the same dynamic where you may have done a very good job in, you know, raising capital for another business within your, you know, geography, within your sector, within your adjacent space. And, you know, we win business on that. And usually it's, on the strength of our ideas and performance and people's understanding that, you know, we're dedicated to a space. That's where, you know, you want to look to have an advisor that's aligned. And this last part we'll talk about again is um, it shouldn't be just one bank. You should, you should get to know multiple banks. Uh, it would be self-serving of me to say you should only speak to Cowan, but um, you know, you should speak to a lot of different banks, understand what they're good at. You should understand there's personality fit. And again, to the point of, as you hit different points in time, different banks are going to be better at certain things. You know, you have M&A boutiques, you have companies that are focused on, you know, raising very early stage growth capital, understand what banks are good at and, um, you know, make sure that at a point in time in which you're making a decision that you're doing so with an understanding of, uh, you know, how people would run a process, who would be running it, where the particular strengths are. So I think I actually I'll just jump in for one second, because I think this would be a good, good spot to talk about an effort that that we've recently organized on our side. It's called C cubed. Cowan Client Catalyst Group. So again, from market feedback, we've heard that there's a need for advisory work with some of the younger companies. And it's something that we are good at already. And it's a great touch point for us to get to know younger companies in the ecosystem to help with advisory work. So think about an outsourcing business strategy solution. So we're able to provide that, be helpful, get to know companies earlier on, that ultimately can potentially roll up into our investment bank when and if they are of need of that service. So investment banks classically um, aren't necessarily ready to deal with younger companies. They're looking for more mature companies. We heard the need that we wanted 
there was that need. Uh, so we built out this group again as a referral service, but also as part of the community and the and the business ecosystem. So I think that's that's something that we've been able to focus in here in Pittsburgh, in a sense that there are plenty of younger companies that need that service. Um, and it, it's been super helpful. And to that point, uh, you know, this, oh, this page, we have a question. So I think part of what we want to do is get to know companies earlier. So the CQ effort is one of those. So for us, that's usually post seed, uh, potentially around series a, but one of the reasons why I'm spending more time at Pittsburgh. So I'm here about a week a month. And the reason for that is, is so that I can be part of the community and start to talk to companies earlier. So there's no hard and fast moment where we say, okay, not talking to them, now talking to them. So being part of the community, we start that dialogue, whether we're formally engaged or not. And by the way, even when we're not formally engaged, we want to be helpful in that business ecosystem. So there are many ways that we can start that connection that can be helpful to early stage growth, even if we're not standing in the middle collecting a toll along the way so that companies can grow and when they grow and then they're ready for uh, classic investment banking services, we're there, we've already established that relationship. So there's not a hard and fast moment but Peter, maybe you want to talk about classic investment banking on kind of where you guys start to get involved. Sure. Yeah, I think this this uh, slide is maybe a, a good way to do that. So if you look at, um, you know, just an illustrative trajectory of a, a growing business, um, you know, as you get towards kind of series A, series B, series C, start generating revenue, you know, that's a point in time when you kind of get to that series C level where we typically get, you know, formally engaged. And part of that's just a function of, um, where we have the, you know, uh, you know, density of relationships on the investor side who are looking for businesses that are you know, starting to generate commercial traction, have kind of proven tech. Um, you know, I think that's, that's the point in time where we, from our banking relationships, could bring the most value. Um, and as you continue the trajectory, when you get to the point in time and you're thinking about, um, you know, maybe evaluating potential exit alternatives, whether that's raising um, you know, public equity or seeking um, you know, a, a, an exit through a sale, you know, that's when we bring in additional resource partners you know, on the capital raising side through both our private capital and equity capital markets groups, and then through our M&A team. Um, and so really what this is intended to illustrate is, you know, we wanna start the relationship early. Kyle made reference, we have something that's a little bit unique called um, you know, the client, sorry, Cowan Client Catalyst, which is not easy to say. Um, where we CQ. start, we yeah. made it easy. CQ. Yeah, we start to get to know companies early on, developing that relationship. You know, providing kind of uh, you know less formal banking services, but where we put actual you know not just uh, industry expertise like myself who spend time on it, but actually dedicated resources within the group that can help you with you know particular projects that are relevant to the business at that point in time. And then as you hit different milestones along the way, you know, bringing the full resources of the firm to bear. Um, and again, that's that's something that um, you know other banks can do as well to a certain degree, you know, better than others. There are certainly banks, you know, on the larger side who you know may try to pick up on those relationships further to the right on this page because um, you know for for them they're they're solving for you know a larger minimum fee opportunity than somebody like Cowan is. We like to start that early, uh, develop that relationship over time, and then grow the relationship by delivering services that are relevant along the way. And we'll go through this page because there's obviously uh, a lot of words here, but I think um, the point that this that this page is trying to illustrate is as you hit different inflection points in your growth as a company, you have a different you know set of alternatives that you're deciding between. You know, it's do you raise outside capital in the first case? Um, you know, do you want to bring in a outside venture partner? Do you want to try to go it alone? Um, you know, do you when you reach a certain point in time? Do you want to sell a portion of the business to de-risk, uh, crystallize some of the value creation? You know, would you like to go public? Is being a public company an objective? Um, you know, are you at a point in time where the story you're telling would resonate in the public markets, either from kind of a scale or business model standpoint? 
Would you be a buyer of business? Would you be looking to sell your business? So a lot of times it's, you know, you get an inbound expression of interest from somebody who sees value in what you've created. Uh, is that worthy of consideration? Um, and by the way, I think the, the, uh, the, the point you should take away from this is you're doing a lot of these oftentimes simultaneously. It's never, you know, just one or the other. You may say, you know, should we raise capital or should we sell? Should we go public or should we be open to a sale? A lot of these are being valued, or sorry, being evaluated rather, um, you know, as part of a process in which you're considering, you know, pros and cons of particular alternatives. And that's where, you know, you're having dialogue with investors, with board members. And when you're speaking with an investment bank who's uh, knowledgeable about your story, the space, the landscape, you could bring the added benefit of kind of an outside third party perspective, um, you know, based from, you know, all the conversations that we're having within the broader ecosystem in which you operate. What I wanted to do on this page is uh, try to make a little bit of that more tangible through some kind of, you know, specific examples of, of transactions that we as a firm have worked on recently uh, to illustrate that point that it's never as straightforward as should we do this or should we not? A lot of times it's, you know, should we you know, go one direction versus another, or can we pursue those in tandem? And part of the part of the role of an investment banker is to structure a process where you can evaluate uh, those alternatives and ultimately give you the choice of um, options in choosing your outcome. So the first case, um, you know, business that uh, has a you know piece picking fulfillment technology. Um, there was a transaction that happened very recently within their space. Direct competitor was bought by a large strategic. There was a sense based on the landscape of other strategics that were operating that you know maybe they were likely to become a target. They were also at a point in time in which they were getting within line of sight of kind of the end of their cash runway. And so the decision was, you know, should we also consider a sale or is it premature for that? Uh, otherwise, it would be kind of the point in time where we would be gearing up to go raise you know a Series C round, as the case was here. And so, you know, what our role in this case was to pursue the, both of those simultaneously. And so, you know, what we what we advised the board in this instance was, you know, the best way to maximize successful outcome in a sale is to have a um, you know robust capital raise process. So, you know, evaluation benchmark around that you feel good about in terms of capital to continue to grow the business to address the larger opportunity. And then, if somebody wanted to pay a price that was a premium to that, you can evaluate that if it came. Um, as it turned out in this instance, uh, it was a you know, highly oversubscribed round. Um, they were very happy about the partners they brought in that, you know, I think helped accelerate kind of the strategic vision of the business, both geographically, but also within the space. And so they ultimately decided to, um, you know, close on that capital round um, as their chosen path. The second one, um, merger transaction, a, a very young company. So probably I would say earlier than, you know, we typically... Um, would take on as an engaged basis. So probably like within the, the C3 um, stage. So, you know, pot, uh, a company that was a, you know, heavier payload kind of AMR business, um, you know, had a bunch of pilots, but not necessarily generating consistent revenue to it. The founder had a, um, you know, kind of prior experience of, of operating a company that had venture investors. He wasn't necessarily enamored with that route. And so, you know, they had, they had bootstrapped it to that point and, you know, they're, their um, preference was to see, hey, we, we would go out and raise capital to build out all these organizational capabilities, which we would probably ultimately view as redundant if it was very successful by selling to a company that already had those. Would there be a, a business that's out there that from a product uh, perspective would value you know, what we've developed in that point? And could we structure a transaction that would allow us to kind of crystallize some of the value we created, pay back some of the investors who would help us bootstrap it to that point, and then maybe share in the upside. And so we ran a very limited process. We said, you know, look, um, it's a little bit early for us, but you know, we, we can, we know the landscape. We can probably think of three or four guys that'd be really interested. Let's give those guys a call, see what they say. And, you know, if there's not a lot of receptivity, then, you know, we can go down the capital raising path and you know, help make some investor introductions on that basis. And as it turned out, there was a you know, large AMR company who you know, had this on their product roadmap, what these guys did that really accelerated their kind of product development, um, structured transaction where they got you know, amount of cash and then took uh, equity in the private business so that you know, as the business continued to grow and they saw kind of the shared value creation that they were able to share in that. And then the last one, 
um, sale of the company. This is a, a business that um, had raised multiple rounds of venture. Um, they had not experienced kind of the commercial traction they had expected. I think there was a view that, you know, their next round was going to be a lot harder relative to the valuation they had priced the prior round at, you know, and, and you know, their relative underperformance. And so their view was, you know, look, we, we've got interesting technology. We haven't figured out the sales side. Um, you know, there's a bunch of interesting uh, companies that I think we could fit with. Let's look for a sale. The dynamic that was a little unique here is that, um, you know, they had brought in a sizable strategic investor in one of their early rounds. And so the, um, the sale transaction was made a little bit more tricky by the perception outside from other, you know, potentially interested parties that, you know, if that party who knew it best, who would be a likely buyer, wasn't likely to buy the business, you know, why should we? And so I, uh, ultimately they sold to that company uh, that was an existing investor. It was a good outcome, but uh, the point I think that's worth taking away, and again, this is useful for your thinking and, and maybe where you know, banks like ourselves can be helpful in your thinking through some of the early investor conversations that you bring in is um, decisions that you make very early on in your kind of uh, company life cycle can have implications for an, an eventual exit. So you know, there's certainly a lot of value a strategic investor can bring at certain points of time, whether it's access to a customer, penetrating a market, um, accelerating product roadmap, you know, accelerating a lot of other initiatives. It also means that when you're evaluating your exit, that may also kind of preclude you from fully exploring the broader range of alternatives. And so thinking about those trade-offs when you're making decisions early on, I think is, is something where you know, certainly your board will have a perspective, but it's also useful to probably get an outside perspective and say, you know, here's kind of the pros and cons, you know, and then you can make a best decision based on the information you have at that point in time. Okay. When Pittsburgh companies look to raise big rounds, and at least the ones in, in the recent past, they have to go to the coast to get some of these big checks. How do you think about um, marketing Pittsburgh companies, you know, whether it's for investors in, in late stage rounds or IPOs or whatever it may be, to some of these coastal investors that may have uh, I don't know if bias is the right term, but may have a certain perception of, of Pittsburgh companies versus SF versus New York, whatever it may be. Well, I, th I think that's why we're spending more time here. And when I say we, it's not just Callan and not just myself, but the sponsor business that we've created. So private equity, VC, family office, strategics that Peter talks to, right? And doing some education around that. And I think what we found is in markets like Pittsburgh, amazing opportunities, less competition, potentially don't demand quite as high of a multiple. So there is some value creation here. And that's how we market these parts of, of the United States kind of inside those lines where we can get great outcomes around. So bringing that fresh capital in, finding great opportunity where everybody walks away what they, what they potentially perceive as good value. Yeah, and I just add to that, I mean, there's, um... The one thing as we think about the developing kind of ecosystem around Pittsburgh that may be missing relative to you know Boston or maybe you know the Silicon Valley environment is there the density of opportunities for investment, um, I think, you know, is right up there with with any kind of environment. What's missing is kind of the dedicated capital in market that exists today. But I think what you are seeing is no shortage of investor interests, um, you know, in, in getting to know and navigating the landscape here. Certainly we can be helpful in that because, you know, we know a lot of the companies here and have gotten to know, um, you know, the, a lot of the businesses that are developing and can make a lot of introductions on that basis. But, you know, it's, it's certainly not a well-kept secret anymore of, you know, what Pittsburgh has become in terms of, you know, some of the growthier areas. And I think what you're seeing is, um, you know, increasing emphasis and in, in spending time around those environments from investors who may still be situated on the coast, but certainly have a focus on, you know, where there's, um, you know, target uh, ripe environment for the types of opportunities they're looking for. And I'd actually say that the volatility that we're seeing in the marketplace right now actually helps places like Pittsburgh. So the cap, a lot of the capital that we're in touch with has already been raised, right? They're definitely more picky on how they're making their investments. Um, so the fact that we're able to sort of introduce great opportunity and value to pockets of capital that are already existing, that will be around potentially for the next four to seven years that have already been raised before the market volatility, 
I think just lines up really well for Pittsburgh and lines up well for us as a conduit to make those introductions. So I guess kind of a few key takeaways just to you know, try to wrap up and, and certainly welcome any questions that you guys have um, afterwards. You know, I think the point I want to make, which, um, you know, hopefully filtered through in the discussion is that you should be intentional in, in developing banker relationships early on. It does, you know, there are certainly bankers um, who, you know, be more interested where there's an immediate fee opportunity. But I think, you know, the ones from an early stage who are willing to spend time to get to know your story, to try to find ways to be relevant, who think that you have, you know, who have an appreciation for what you're building and why it might be unique and special. You know, those are the banks that, you know, you want to get to know early, spend time telling your story. Uh, and, and by the way, you know, a lot of that's being responsive to inbound outreach to them. But, you know, don't be shy if you see, you know, a research report from a company like Cowan or one of our competitors that you think is interesting. You know, reach out to the investment banker at that firm and, and get to know them, ask them questions, um, see how receptive they are to be helpful. Um, and, you know, I made this point early on do that with multiple banks because, you know, at certain points in time, um, you know, whether it's personality or whether it's product fit or whether it's your particular uh, business, you know, there are going to be banks that are just, you know, a better fit for you. And so understanding both the personalities and the institutions, I think is, is important. And so if, if you're doing that, you know, all from the point in time in which you actually, you know, require services, you know, that's, that's, that's a tougher starting point than, you know, already having kind of established set of relationships and then understanding who's the best fit for the opportunity that you have. Um, you know, I would say, and I made this point, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help from bankers. So, you know, whether it's, hey, I'm trying to understand the competitive landscape, I'm putting together my investor deck, can you take a look at the model? Can you give me, you know, your view? Does this make sense? Will this resonate? You know, what will investors want to focus on? Uh, you know, will these unit economics resonate? Is the profitability profile too far into the future? Um, you know, the point made early on is, you know, we see a lot of companies um, and we also have a lot of investor conversations and we get a lot of real-time feedback as to, as, in, as uh, the market evolves, you know, what are different areas of emphasis? And, you know, we can be an added perspective and saying, you know, here's what I expect, uh, you know, an investor is going to ask about, here's what they're going to focus on. You know, you may want to tailor some of the positioning to that, or at least be prepared to be responsive to those requests so that you put your company within the best light when you're having those conversations. And by the way, you may be saying, hey, can you uh, think about, you know, a few investors of a certain profile that would be a good fit for, you know, the company we're building at this stage? You know, they may not be, um, you know, companies that, or they may not be investors that, you know, we're oftentimes reaching out to as part of a broader raise, but certainly, um, you know, companies we know as, as part of, you know, our coverage of the space and, and you know, understanding who's really prioritizing certain areas. So so to your point on that, just one real time, I just, so talking to a company here in Pittsburgh that was having early stage company, uh, has some pre-revenue, uh, having some manufacturing issues, came to us, made some introductions, talked to the banker in their space. The banker was actually able to make, um, to kill two birds with one stone, basically. Talk to them about their manufacturing challenges, but also introduce them to capital that can help them with their manufacturing problems. So in those cases, again, Cowan not standing in the middle collecting a fee, but being part of the ecosystem uh, to help those younger companies grow so that eventually they get to a point where we can be more helpful. Yep. And then the last point I make is just, you know, be be open and kind of sharing your vision for the business. Like, what are you trying to solve for? Where What are you trying to achieve? Um, you know, how do you you know, how do you view the path to getting there by understanding that and having parties outside, you know, your, your company that are operating within the broader landscape, understanding of that vision, you know, it can be another set of eyes and ears. And so, you know, the, the company I mentioned in terms of the, uh, you know, sale, the AMR business to a larger company happened to know both those parties and understanding, you know, in one instance where the larger business, when they lost out on competitive processes, because they lacked a piece of the technology that this filled. And so, you know, having somebody out there saying like, okay, you know, actually these would be an interesting set of companies to come together. You guys should talk to each other. Um, you know, that's, that's a useful resource for you to have. And, you know, by sharing kind of where you see your company going, you know, the, the specific kind of fit of your business, there's probably 
probably other parties out there, including with investment banks who you know can help um, you know further your strategic vision. Yeah, and I would just say also talk to those that are in the community that have gone through the process already. I like to say the uh, the cream always rises to the top, so that as you talk to other participants that have had some success or interaction with investment banks and are willing to share it, you will then find who is committed to the area that you're in or the geographic region they're in or who have already had some success along the way. So I think that networking in and amongst the community is super important also. Um, yeah, so look, if there's one thing that we wanna get across here is that uh, we'd like you to view us as a partner, Cowan as a partner. Um, we, uh, if you look at the check bullet points here, we've, we've talked about all of them. Um, we uh, were committed to being here as part of the ecosystem. Um, again, I, I left, so inside the firm, I was in a different part of the firm for almost 10 years, had an opportunity to spend more time in Pittsburgh as part of our strategic capital group. And to me, it made a ton of sense. Being a Pittsburgher, having the perspective of living in New York, and wanting to actually be here and be part of the community, uh, I think just gives us an edge uh, that not many others have. Um, so we understand that there will people that come in and out of the community uh, to do business. Uh, we wanna be here for, on, a permanent, uh, on a permanent basis to hear and be part of not just business, but part of the community doing things like this. Um, so we'd love to, love to continue the dialogue uh, I think, you know, your takeaway is if you have any questions, not even just today, where you want to reach out, I'm a great resource, Peter's a great resource, uh, Adriana is a great resource, and, uh, and we're happy to, uh, to help. And again, if we can't help, we can point you in the right direction, whether it's internally or by the way, externally. I think that's it. Thanks. So we'll take questions. I'm sure. I'm sure there are questions either in the room or online. If we haven't addressed certain things, I, we did such a good job that there are no questions. I find that I find that hard to believe. Dave, you always got questions. Come on. <laughs> uh, I know. I know. I know. A lot of the folks in the room here are, are students, and, and some of them have companies in Philadelphia. We've got a whole guy like Tom and me in here, too. Uh, but, uh, so, they find it pretty intimidating for them to, to say, oh, hey, Kyle, hey, Peter, I have a question for you. But that's really why you're here, right? The, you know, yeah, yes, you need to know what an investment bank is, and then you can engage them in business. These guys are here now to help the members of the community to put an emphasis on what Kyle just said. So um, don't don't be afraid. If, if you have a question in your head right now, someone else in the room has that question in your head. So fire away. Yep. And by the way, super. I think one of the things we're good at is being accessible overall. So that if it's not today, although we'd like to answer some today, uh, if it's not today, we're around and easily accessible throughout. Yeah, and I, I think uh, you know the other the other side of that. Um, you know, I think there's probably some element where, you know, early on, you may say, you know, I'm, I'm not relevant to these guys today. I'm not a fee paying, uh, you know, client at this point in time, you know, will I get attention? That's one side. And again, trying to disabuse of that notion, because again, our, our, our commitment as a firm in trying to get involved in areas like robotics, like, you know, the EV space where we've also had success and a lot of other areas, health, healthcare, biotech previously is to get to know companies early before you know there's immediate relevance. Uh, the other half of that, which you know I think is is also relevant to the discussion, is you get different points in time where you are relevant to a lot of investment banks, and um, you know sometimes there's this other notion of hey, you know like um, I don't need to talk to you right now because uh, I don't have an immediate need for your services. Um, and you know the point point we would make would be similar in those instances as well as like. Groups that are active within your space can be an extension of your organization, can bring you a different set of ideas than you have internally. And it's worthwhile um, you know, to have those conversations for those groups and those firms that you think are relevant to you. And so getting to understand who those are uh, is always to your benefit. We have an online question. Um, does Cowan provide service for companies and startups abroad or only for in 
Yeah, so we are uh, an international firm. So the answer to that question is, is that uh, we do provide um, globally, internationally, for sure. We're going to go to a fresh question, then we'll get to you, Pat. Yes, so uh, I have a question about, like, so you mentioned the ESG metrics, like the, the part where it's going towards more sustainable investment. Right? Um, does Raven have, like, specific parts of the organization that are geared towards, like, social enterprise uh, things that are impacting, like, more uh, high impact communities, like, 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 like the, going towards like, abroad and things like that? Or, sure. Uh, is it practically? No, I, I, that's a great question. So we have four core tenets that we go by. Vision, empathy, tenacious teamwork, and sustainability. Sustainability being a big piece of our growing franchise, not only because we think it's important, but we've gotten great feedback from our customers that it's important. So just recently, we hired a woman uh, to come on board that has done a, a tremendous amount of work around sustainability and ESG as a banker. And so she'll be super helpful in working with companies outside of some of our industry specific bankers to make sure that we're hitting and, and marketing to proper companies or making sure companies are banking themselves properly. So another function that we found that we can be helpful in, and again, that's been listening to our customers, um, the feedback we've gotten around the ESG on the research side, uh, both from uh, our institutional customers and just abroad, uh, has been tremendous. So we understand that we we like to be early in places that matter. Um, and we think that, that that helps differentiate us. And again, usually uh, we're reactive or listening to customers and then trying to build solutions around uh, some feedback from our customers. Yep. Yeah, let's let's say you're a really early stage company, maybe students working on an idea and you haven't raised money yet. Uh, would it still be reasonable to reach out to you guys and, and what would like the first conversation look like uh you know for those just getting started on their on their journey sure yeah i mean i think um it would be appropriate i think it's again first conversation would be what is it that you're you know trying to solve for what are you looking to build and you know certainly there you know to the extent that it has you know relevance to areas that we're spending time you know that's a absolutely an area where there's a lot of existing resources that we have, whether it's pulling in, you know, research that we have, whether it's, you know, information we have from activities in space, you know, if you're looking to size a market, if you're looking to say, you know, like, who competes in this space, um, you know, what do valuations look like in the space, you know, all of those things kind of in, in sizing the opportunity and thinking about like an early business plan. Um, it's, completely appropriate to ask those questions and where we have uh, ability to, you know, kind of bring relevance across the platform to bear, you know, again, we're happy to do that. And I, I would just say this, we might be a little bit older and it might, we might've been students just a few years ago. Uh, but the one thing I know is that I don't know everything. So it's really important for us to have those conversations because we continue to learn also. Um, so we're happy to have those conversations early on. Dave? Just to put it in the vocabulary of one of these chapters, one of my So by the way, beyond just the research, conference calls, conferences, like those are all things that we're happy to invite you to or to, to share um, because we think they're, they're helpful. And we think that uh, through a broad array of coverage universe, uh, we can hopefully differentiate. So yeah, it's research, conferences, conference calls, anything, but happy to have as many dialogues as, as needed question just out of curiosity besides the fire and the terrible ideas 
So what's the market angle on ESPs and for startups? Is there any way to like move into the activity at the different kinds of companies? So I would say that it's it's a, a balance between both. So I wouldn't say that one is more important than the other. I would say, though, that where a few years ago, sustainability or ESG wasn't part of the conversation, it is now both from the customer side and the consumer side. So there is aware, an awareness um, from that perspective that I think Having a banker that pays attention to that on top of industry specific bankers is super helpful. Yeah, and I, I'd say, look, if you're um, you know, raising capital privately, I think you know, if you're solving for kind of a long-term sustainability solution, there are dedicated funds increasingly focused on investing along those themes. And so certainly, you know, it could be helpful in navigating those and, and what they look for. And then when you get to the public side, um, you know, I'd say that's certainly part of the conversation as well. Obviously, it's a big focus, but there's also, you know, an increasing awareness that, you know, some of that may be perceived as window dressing. And so, you know, as you get to like that stage can also be helpful in thinking through that as well. Or, you know, telling somebody, hey, you may think that you're going to pitch to ESG investors, but, you know, if you have a uh, element of your business that's, you know, say within, uh, you know, defense or something like that. Uh, along with some of the sustainability stuff, that's going to be a no-go for ESG investors. And so, you know, again, it's it's uh, it, it can be useful in saying, you know, here's a way you can, you know, pitch your story in a way that will resonate. Or by the way, you know, if you're going down this path, it may not be as successful. So I think it goes both ways. Yeah. 